Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll be starting on today's Health Talk, uh, Partnering Your Diabetes Journey, the multidisciplinary approach shortly. Uh, on to our main topic for today, let me just uh, introduce our speakers that we have on the panel. We have Dr. Yo Pei Shan, a consultant from the Department of Endocrinology, Senior Pharmacist Ong Jiamin from Pharmacy, Advanced Practice Nurse Joyce Yenxia from the Department of Endocrinology, and Dietitian Brian Lee from the Nutrition and Dietetics Department. So um, on to our first speaker for today, we have Dr. Yo Pei Shan. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and thank you for sharing your afternoon with us. I will kickstart today's session by telling us more about diabetes and what is diabetes before handing over the session to the rest of my colleagues to tell us each and each part of the bits and pieces of how we can take care of our diabetes at home. Firstly, I think many of us have this on our mind. What exactly is diabetes? And when our doctors tell us we have diabetes, what are they exactly talking about? Diabetes is actually a condition where we cannot handle sugar properly, resulting in too much sugar in the bloodstream. There are several different forms and types of diabetes. These are the three common types that we see in our clinic and our usual practice, and I'll focus on some of them today. We have type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, as well as gestational diabetes, which is a form of diabetes that occur in the later parts of some pregnancy. Today, I'll focus on type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Firstly, let's look at type 2 diabetes, which is the most common subtype of diabetes and what we commonly hear about when we talk about Tang Yao Bing or diabetes. Uh, what happens is that there is a problem with insulin. And in type 2 diabetes, we can make insulin in our body. However, this insulin that we make cannot work properly and is very ineffective in action. Looking at this picture, what it means is that many of our patients with type 2 diabetes are actually overweight or obese. When this happens, there is excess internal fat in our body making our body and our cells less sensitive to insulin. Our body cells cannot sense insulin properly, even though the pancreas is producing it. And as a result, the pancreas has to produce more insulin to do the same amount of work that it used to. Type 2 diabetes is hence when insulin is ineffective. Looking at the arrow and the box, where one, green key, which represents the insulin, used to be able to do the same amount of work it used to. Now we need two insulin molecules or two green key to unlock and make use of one single molecule of sugar or glucose that we used to take. The pancreas hence has to work a lot harder than it used to. And when the body cannot cope, this is when type 2 diabetes actually happens. Now let's talk about type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is something that we commonly hear in the children, uh, young children who could be of healthy body weight, with no other medical problems previously. What happens in type 1 diabetes is that the body is not able to make insulin, resulting in, in, in insufficient insulin in the body. And this is often due to a pancreas breakdown and an autoimmune process where the body is attacking its own pancreas, resulting in the inability to make insulin. Like I mentioned earlier, insulin is required to move sugar, otherwise known as blood glucose, into the cells to generate energy and maintain normal body functions. However, in type 1 diabetes, the pancreas is sick it has fallen ill and can no longer make insulin, which is the green key that we see here. And there is no more hormone that is responsible to uptake and make use of this glucose that we are now taking, resulting in a residual very high level of sugar in the bloodstream. So we know that ministry has declared a war on diabetes a couple of years ago with a lot of talks and advertisements on how we can prevent diabetes and pre-diabetes. 
So exactly how common is this problem in Singapore? It is more common than we think of it to be. Actually, one in three Singaporeans is at risk of developing diabetes. One in nine Singaporeans has diabetes. And unfortunately, one in three of us actually do not know that we already have diabetes to be diagnosed and to be treated. So let me tell us about more about how we can find out if we have diabetes, some of the signs and symptoms that we could be experiencing and facing, and how we can get a checkup and what our doctors usually do to find out if we have diabetes. Here are some common signs and symptoms of diabetes, which is due to high blood sugar or what we call hyperglycemia. Firstly, we may feel thirsty because of the high sugar load in our bloodstream and the body's inability to make use of it. As a result of thirst, we drink a lot more water and we visit the toilet a, more, a lot more frequently to pass urine. Diabetes is often described as hunger in the state of plenty because the cells in our body cannot make use of the high blood sugar that's already there, we often feel very hungry and the need to continuously eat despite having very high blood sugar. Unknowingly, diabetes can be in our body for many years, resulting in diabetes complications such as diabetes eye problem. Hence, we may have blurred vision. In addition, the high blood sugar can also make our vision blur, resulting in blurred vision as one of our presenting problems to see a doctor for help and have being diagnosed with diabetes after that. As a result of high blood sugar, we may feel unwell, fuzzy, giddy, and even have headaches. And because of us being unable to use the sugar properly uh, and despite eating a lot, we may still experience an unintentional loss of weight. This high blood sugar can also result in a poor immune system over time and poor blood vessels over time. So when we sustain cuts and wounds on our body, we may not be able to heal well and it may result in slow healing wounds. If we ever have a chance of uh, using a blood sugar meter as shown in the last picture, we may detect alarmingly high blood sugar values that's more than 15 millimoles per liter. If we have a combination of these signs and symptoms, we should see a doctor to see if a diabetes blood test is necessary and if we have undiagnosed diabetes. So when we visit the doctor, what does the doctor do to ascertain what kind of blood test we need and what are some of the blood tests that the doctors order in our clinic? when we face a patient with potential diabetes. It depends on whether we have any signs and symptoms. If we do, we often only need one blood test to diagnose diabetes. When we are well, for example, going for a health screening, we sometimes more often than not need two blood tests to confirm the diagnosis of diabetes. So what are some of the blood tests that we order in our clinic? We test blood sugar level not just via a finger prick on the blood sugar meter that I shown earlier, but we also draw blood from the blood veins to test. There are several ways we do it. The first is to come to a clinic on an empty stomach, not, eat, not having not eaten for the last 8 to 12 hours. On top of that, some of our doctors may subject us to a very sweet drink that contains 75 grams of sugar to put the blood... Uh, the, the, our body to the test to see if we're able to bring down the blood sugar adequately. This is also known as the oral glucose tolerance test. Lastly, like I mentioned earlier, in cases of emergency or if we have diabetes symptoms, we may undergo a random blood test in the clinic. This next busy slide actually tells us why we should diagnose ourselves with diabetes when we have one and the reason for taking good care of di our diabetes, which our pharmacist Jia Min, our nurse Lian Xia, and our di dietitian Brian will go through more with us later in detail. It is because diabetes can have bad effects 
known as complications in our body, affecting many parts, including the brain, causing stroke, affecting the eyes, causing eye problems with end-stage problems known as, uh, including blindness, many teeth and tooth problems and gum diseases, heart attacks, kidney problems, including dialysis. Diabetes is one of the leading causes of dialysis in Singapore. And lastly, foot wounds and ulcers and in severe cases, even amputation. Diabetes complications are not uncommon. In fact, two in three individuals with newly diagnosed kidney failure actually have diabetes. One in three individuals with diabetes have diabetes eye problems. And every single day, about four individuals in Singapore with diabetes have to undergo some form of amputation as a result of poorly controlled diabetes and poor healing foot wounds and ulcers. I'll now hand over the session to Jiamin, our pharmacist, to tell us more about medications in the treatment of diabetes. So thanks, Dr. Yeo, for sharing about how to diagnose and what is diabetes. I'm Jiamin, I'll be sharing more about the treatment options in diabetes and how to manage low blood sugars. So this is Mr. ABC. He's a 50-year-old gentleman who has type 2 diabetes on two uh, medications, metformin and glipizide. He likes local delights like mee siam, chendol, and drinks bubble tea very regularly. As he is busy with work, he's usually on the computer all the time and has no time to exercise at all. So one day, Mr. ABC feels a little bit unwell. Um, he notices that um, there's a also on his foot and he seeks treatment at Tan Tok Seng Hospital. And at the emergency department, he notices that his HbA1c uh, is high at 8.7% and this is higher than his target of 7%. His random blood sugar is 16.8 and this is higher than the target of less than 10 if taken two hours after a meal. And he has been having symptoms of low, high blood sugar sorry, more frequently, such as feeling more tired thirsty in the past week and passing urine more often. So there are many reasons for inadequate diabetes control. Um, one of the main reasons is uh, missing medications or taking incorrect doses of medications. Um, sometimes patients may also use insulin incorrectly, like injecting the wrong dose, wrong technique, or even using expired insulin. Sometimes it might be due to us not following meal plans or taking excessive alcohol, sedentary lifestyle. Um, underlying illness or infection can also cause our blood sugars to increase. And some medications can also increase our blood sugars, such as steroids. There are many options, uh, of medication options uh, for, the di for diabetes treatment, and they all work in different manners to help our body produce more insulin or use insulin more effectively, or even insulin itself. So the first kind of medication is metformin. It's the most commonly used medication. It helps our body to respond to insulin better and reduces sugar production from the liver. Because it can cause some stomach discomfort and nausea, it is best to take this medication after food. So the next group of medications is sulfonylureas. Uh, this includes glipizide, glipizide, and tobutamide. It increases the amount of insulin released by the pancreas, and it's advised to take immediately before or up to 30 minutes before food. Because it's commonly associated with low blood sugar if meals are skipped or if the appetite is poor, we would suggest to omit the dose if skipping meals entirely. Though, to be honest, we don't suggest to skip meals as far as possible. The next group of medications is DPP-4 inhibitors, including linagliptin, citagliptin, and bildagliptin. It increases the amount of insulin released when the blood sugars are high, usually after a meal, and reduces the amount of sugar made by the liver. It can be taken with or without food, and very rarely it can be associated with joint pain, skin reactions, and this condition called pancreatitis, which is the inflammation of the pancreas, and symptoms of that are shown on the slide including upper abdominal pain that can radiate to the back, increased heart rate, fever, or nausea and vomiting. The next group of medications that are now more commonly used nowadays is, is SGLT2 inhibitors, which include dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, and carnagliflozin. 
So it helps uh, to ex remove excess sugar from the body through the urine and can be taken with or without food. Because of its additional benefits to the heart and kidneys, we see it more commonly used nowadays. However, it can increase the risk of urine infections and therefore it's important to maintain good genital hygiene to reduce the risk of this. And sometimes it can cause giddiness associated with positional changes. It may increase the risk of this uh, diabetic emergency known as DKA. So what is DKA? It is diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a serious condition when there is a buildup of acid in the blood because the body is now breaking down fat instead of sugar. So SGLT2 inhibitors can increase the risk of DKA, and therefore there are some things to take note of when one is unwell while on this medication. We would suggest to omit SGLT2 when you're unwell, especially if you're having a fever or taking, eating or drinking very poorly. To monitor, but then to monitor your blood sugars more regularly when you are ill, because the, this, the sugars can go high or low when you're unwell. A consult to your doctor or healthcare team may be necessary to adjust your medications. Drink sufficient water or as directed by your healthcare team while on this medication. And to seek medical attention immediately if you notice symptoms of DKA, such as nausea, vomiting, tummy pain, woody breath, or shortness of breath, which are shown on this slide. The next group of medications is GLP-1 agonists, and these are some examples of them. It is an injection, but it's a non-insulin injection. It slows down the digestion of sugars and increases the amount of insulin made by the body when the blood glucose is high. It also has additional benefits to the heart, and it may cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, which usually gets better with time, and it can also increase the risk of pancreatitis rarely and therefore do seek medical attention if you have uh, such symptoms. So Mr. ABC's foot wound got better and he got discharged from Tanoxin Hospital and his diabetes medications got adjusted. So the metformin was increased and we added on DP for DPP4, which is linagliptin, to control his blood sugars. However, he came back two months later and in his clinic visit, his HbA1c is now worse at 9.5%, which is way higher than his target HbA1c of 7%. He says he has been taking all his medications regularly as prescribed. However, he's not controlling his diet. He's still experiencing thirst and frequent urinations, the urination even with the medication changes, which as mentioned earlier, are signs of high blood sugar and inadequate control of diabetes. And therefore, he started on insulin. So Dr. Yu has already addressed what is uh, insulin. So this is just a revision. Carbohydrates we eat such as bread, rice, noodles are digested uh, to glucose and absorbed in the, from, into the blood from the intestines, which causes blood sugar to rise. And pancreas, which is a home, uh, organ in our body, is then stimulated by this rise in blood sugar to release insulin. And insulin is a hormone that acts like a key and it allows glucose in the blood to enter the cells and be used for energy. It also stores extra glucose in the muscles and liver for use later. When there isn't enough insulin or if insulin doesn't work properly, but blood glucose levels become abnormally high and cause symptoms of high blood sugar that Mr. ABC is still experiencing. So the tablets and GLP-1 injections that I've talked about earlier encourages our pancreas to make more insulin or make better use of insulin that our body already makes on its own. However, if the pancreas gets really tired after consistently high blood sugars or many years of diabetes, the body can't produce enough in, of its own insulin and the tablets will not work uh, enough, well enough as well. Unfortunately, because uh, if we eat insulin directly, the acid in our stomach will destroy it. Therefore, in Singapore, we, um, the extra insulin in our, that our body needs needs to be injected under our skin. So there are several kinds of insulin. Um, and it's characterized by how fast it works and how long it lasts. The first kind is the basal insulin and the second kind is the mealtime insulin. So this graph shows our body's natural insulin secretion um, in purple. So there's always insulin secreted all, at all times of the day, but when we eat, the our body naturally produces more insulin to cope with the increased amount of sugars uh, in our body. So basal insulin, 
uh, the background insulin is shown by the blue dotted line. And this type of insulin works very steadily throughout the day, including at night when you're sleeping. And the second kind of insulin is meal time or bolus insulin, which is the orange dotted line. This type of insulin works in short spikes and is meant to be paired with your meals. And together, these two types of insulin are then used to mimic the body's natural insulin secretion patterns, which is the purple shaded area. So these are the different kinds of basal insulin. Um, they start acting in about two to four hours and last for about 12 to 24 hours. And this basal insulin should be direct, injected as, direct, as directed by your doctor and it can be given once or twice a day. Insulin lactate is slightly shorter acting, so if you inject in the morning, it will usually last till the night, and some people may need a twice daily dosing. The longer acting insulins usually last for about 24 hours, and it can usually be given once a day in most cases. The next kind is a uh, mealtime insulin, and works in short bursts, and it's meant to mimic the body's natural spike in insulin production when food is eaten. This insulin, the, this insulin is usually work in about 15 to 30 minutes and lasts for about three to six hours. It should be injected before meals so that the insulin has time to start working by the time the glucose from food is absorbed and reaches the blood. This kind of insulin should therefore not be injected if you are planning to skip the meal entirely. The last kind is a, a third group of, in, of insulin, which is a mix of both basal and mealtime insulin. Some examples are mixed tart. Novomix and human log, and the numbers behind the names include the percentage of each type of insulin. So mixed up the 70 basically means 30% of mealtime insulin and 70% of basal insulin. These types of insulin have characteristics of both mealtime and basal insulins. They take action in about 15 or 30 minutes and last for about 12 to 20 hours. Since there is a mealtime insulin component, this insulin should be injected before food as well. And for insulin to work properly, it's important to have good injection, insulin injection technique and ensure you store your injection, insulin injections properly, which will be addressed by Sister Liancia later. So as you can see, there are really many kinds of medications available. It's because there's not only one kind of therapy that fits the patient and the therapy really needs to be tailored to suit the lifestyle of each patient. And a combination of medications help to target the different root causes of high blood glucose and ensure, that the, ensure the tolerability of these medications. So now, after starting on insulin, Mr. ABC's HbA1c is now much better at 7.2%. He's been taking all his medications regularly as prescribed, and now he's finally controlling his diet more and exercising more. And on a really busy day, Mr. ABC skips both his breakfast and lunch, and suddenly in the mid-afternoon, it feels shaky, giddy, and hungry. So these are symptoms of low blood sugar, which is also known as hypoglycemia, and happens when the blood sugar is less than 4 millimol per liter. There are various causes of hypoglycemia, including poor appetite, delay on skipping a meal, doing more uh, intense activities than usual, or taking wrong doses of diabetic medications, drinking excessive alcohol, or if there's a worsening in kidney or liver function. So these are symptoms of low blood sugar. It's important to recognize them so that you know what to do when all these symptoms happen. So symptoms include cold sweat, heart beating fast, tremors, excessive hunger, weakness, or in if severe cases, one might be really drowsy or even happy. Um, so this, so for when you have low blood sugar, the first thing to do is to check uh, your blood sugar to see if it's an uh, episode of low blood sugar. If the reading is less than 4 millimole per liter, uh, remember the 15-15 rule to take 15 grams of fast-acting sugar, which includes half a cup of fruit juice or uh, three hard candies. Um, try to avoid things that are high in fats like milk, cake, uh, hot chocolate, because they are slower acting, and then wait for 15 minutes and check your blood sugar level again. If it's still low, repeat steps two or three, and then wait for 15 minutes. If it's still low, seek medical attention immediately. However, if the blood, low blood sugar results and now your sugar is above four, do eat a small meal or a snack uh, to ensure that your blood sugar is maintained still at the normal range. 
and do record all these uh, episodes of low blood sugar and inform your doctor at the next visit so we can see how to adjust your medications. So these are some, there are some ways to prevent low blood sugar. And um, these include to take your medications as prescribed, take regular meals, don't skip your meals, check your blood sugar uh, before exercise, do not drink excessive alcohol, and also always to carry sweets with you so that if you have low blood sugar, you can rescue yourself. Lah. Okay, so that's all for my presentation. And now I'll be passing the time to Sister Lian Xia, who will be talking about insulin injection techniques. Thank you, Jami. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joyce. I'm the advanced practice nurse of endocrine department. I'm going to share insulin injection. What are the essential tips? This is the outline of the this afternoon section. Insulin is a hormone produced by the organ called pancreas. The function of the insulin is to move the sugar from the bloodstream into the body cells for energy or storage. Insulin is injected into the fatty tissue that is between the skin and muscle layer. This is called a subcutaneous tissue or subcutaneous injection. Collect insulin injection technique and needle lens are very important components for adequate insulin delivery and adequate insulin absorption. Insulin can be given using three devices. You can give through the insulin syringe, insulin pen, disposable or reusable, or insulin pump. In Singapore, we use the insulin syringe U100. It is paired with a U100 concentrated insulin which means 100 units per meal. In some countries, they use a U40 or U500 insulin. It is very important to use a correct insulin syringe to avoid overdosing or underdosing insulin. Syringe comes in different size and needle lengths. For 100 unit syringe, marks two units of insulin. For 50 and 30 unit syringe, mark one unit of the insulin. Use a syringe large enough to contain a whole dose of the insulin. If you are required eight unit insulin injection, it is best to use the 30 unit of the syringe rather than 50 unit or 100 unit syringe. Insulin pen needle also come with a different lens. Currently, we have a 4 mm, 5 mm, 6 mm, 8 mm in the market. 12.7 mm has been phased out of the market. The gauge is about 31 to 32 G. So let's pull a question. How often do you change insulin, syringe, or pain needles? Please select your answer. Let's show the results. Okay, I think most of you did very well. You change the insulin syringe or needle after each injection. So insulin syringe and needles need to be discarded after each injection. Now let's talk about the risk of reusing needles. Reusing insulin syringe or pen needles could increase the followings. First, the bacteria can grow on the needle, cause a skin infection. You might experience pain when injecting the insulin. Also got risk of the lumpy formations. You can see the pictures on the top there. And beside this, you also can see that if you reuse the insulin needle, it will destroy the needle tips as shown in the picture. This is a new needles. You can see the tip of the needle is very sharp. If after the needle reuse twice and six times, then you can see the tip of the needle is totally is destroyed. So if you use a reuse of a needle, it might cause a tissue micro trauma, which result you often see that have released a bruise and bleedings on the injection site. Besides this, also have a risk of breaking off the front tip of the needles. Now let's talk about insulin pump. An uh, insulin pump is a battery-operated insulin delivery device about the size of the pager that close mimic the action of the pancreas in delivering insulin. 
The pump infuses a rapid acting insulin just below the skin and is usually worn on the abdominal, buttocks, or hip. Injury injection site. The belly is the best place for injury injection. This is because the belly area can absorb the insulin most consistently. It is easier to assess and often less painful. The insulin absorption is slower in the thigh than the belly areas. You also can inject the insulin on the arm and the buttocks. So let's pull another question. Please select your answer. Thank you. Let's show the results. So you can see 67% of the people use support MMY lifting a skin pole. So I will go to these uh, questions. Select so appropriate needle lens is very important to avoid the intramuscular injection, which means that you don't want to inject the insulin into the muscles and to prevent the low blood sugar events. We usually recommend our patients to use the 5 mm or 4 mm insulin pen needles and 6 mm syringe. If you are very thin, then you might need to lift your skin fold or go by 45 degree if you use the insulin syringe 6 mm. This uh, picture illustrates that a lot of studies show that the skin thickness from, for us is appropriate 1.25 to 3.25 mm in 90% of the individuals. And our skin thickness, the average is about 2 to 2.5 mm. Therefore, 4 mm and 5 mm insulin pen needle are sufficient to deliver the insulin into the fat layer. So how to lift the skin hole? Whether lift, lifting a skin fold is required based on the need needle lens use. The optimal sequence should be, first, you lift the skin fold. Second, you inject the insulin slowly at a 90 degree to the surface of the skin fold. Third, lift the needle in the skin for a count of the 10 when you're injecting a pain. And number four is resolve the needle from the skin at the same angle it was inserted. Number five, you release the skin fold. Then lastly, you dispose of the used needle safely. Rotate insulin injection site is very important to avoid the lumpy formation in the injection site. It is promote the better insulin absorption. You may want to divide the injection site into the four quadrants. Use one quadrant per week. Move clockwise along the areas and space at least one cm apart at each injection area. You also can use a side rotation grids. How to care of the injection site? The injection site should be checked before injection. Try to avoid all the lumpy areas. It should be cleaned using a clean hands. If you use the alcohol swab to clean the injection site, then the skin must be wet complete dry before you do the insulin injection. Insulin should never be injected into the areas of lumpy areas, swelling, wound, or infection, or have a nodules, scar tissues, or tattoos. Insulin should not be injected through the clothing. So what are the take-home message? Discuss with your healthcare providers to decide which needle length is the best for you. Rotate the injection site. Do not inject insulin into the scar tissues or lumpy areas. Do not reuse a syringe or needles. Discard syringe or needles after each injection. With that, I thank you for your attention. Now I will hand over to my colleague, dietitian, Ryan. Okay, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian and I'll be um, going through with you guys about the two dietary recommendations for diabetes. Okay, so for this slide, right, the di definition of diabetes, I probably won't be going through because I believe um, Dr. Yo already went through. So I'll skip this slide. All right. Okay, so basically, right, um, how, di how diet affects diabetes is that uh, when we eat carbohydrate containing food, such as uh, your rice, noodle, your pasta, your bread, this kind of stuff, right, it gets digested into sugar, 
and the sugar is then absorbed into the bloodstream, which causes our blood sugar level to increase. All right, this blood sugar level increase will stimulate the pancreas to produce insulin, which will help the sugar to enter the, um, the body cells to give us energy and to support the body function. Uh, okay. So basically today, uh, what I'll be going through will be the two dietary recommendations for diabetes, mainly the controlling carbohydrate intake to consistent carbohydrate distribution, appropriate carbohydrate intake and to avoid refined sugars. All right, the second point would be to increase the fiber intake. Okay, so what are carbohydrates? So carbohydrates are mainly like your rice, your bread, your kway teow, your bihun, your noodles, your pasta, your biscuit, um, your tose, chapati, and also your oats. La. Okay, I think there's are, there are like some formatting error. La. So some of the words are missing. La. Okay, but just don't mind. Just don't mind that. All right, so some vegetables do contain carbohydrates as well. So these are like your starchy vegetables, like your potato, sweet potato, yam, corn, tapioca, and also all fruits. All fruits do contain carbohydrates. Okay, so dairy products do contain carbohydrates as well. They are like your milk, milk powder, yogurt, and also your lentils, uh, I mean your legumes. So legumes are things like your baked beans, kidney beans, uh, lentils, and also like um, for the Indian food, uh, um, dal, all right? Okay, so basically, right, um, how we control our uh, diabetes, right, is through having a consistent carbohydrate distribution throughout the day. All right, so in this picture, right, you, you can see that um, it's an inconsistent carbohydrate distribution. Uh. Okay, so um, the red line in the picture actually represents the blood sugar levels. So what happens when you skip breakfast uh, is that your blood sugar level will naturally be low because you have no food being ingested. All right, so some people may think that, oh, I didn't eat breakfast this morning, so actually I can have a bigger portion of carbohydrate containing meal at dinner time. Okay, so this behavior uh, is actually also known as binge eating or overeating. Uh. Okay, so what happens sometimes when someone skips a meal uh, is that people will uh, tend to feel hungrier at their next meal. All right, so there's actually a higher tendency uh, to overeat. All right, so what happens when someone overeat or binge eat at dinner time? Uh, this can actually cause a spike in their blood sugar levels, which actually causes poor blood sugar control. Okay, so this is actually represented by the red line. I can see that at dinner time, uh, the blood sugar control is actually very high. Okay, so for, whereas for this side, um, you can see that um, across the day, um, there's like regular meals with the same portion of carbohydrates for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh. Okay, so this actually will provide a consistent carbohydrate distribution across the day, which will then uh, improve the blood sugar control. All right, so the blood sugar uh, is actually represented by the blue lines uh, in the picture. All right. Okay, so the main take home message, uh, I mean, to compare between a consistent and inconsistent carbohydrate distribution is that um, it's very important to have a, to maintain a consistent carbohydrate portion throughout the day. Uh and not to skip, skip your meals or have like a larger portion and any meals. Uh. Okay, so now I'll just be talking to you guys about the appropriate carbohydrate intake that we should be having. So to be mindful of the portion sizes of your rice or noodles that you're having at lunch or dinner. Okay, so larger portion of carbohydrates that you're taking uh, actually means that you'll be going to take more carbohydrates. Uh, okay, and then um, this will actually affect the blood sugar. Okay, so this is an, this is an example uh, of a disproportionate carbohydrate meal. Okay, so you can see uh, in the picture, uh, the carbohydrate containing foods are like your baked potato, your baked beans, and also your french fries. Uh. Okay, so the carbohydrate uh, actually make up more than half of the plate. Uh. Okay, so how much, so now you've been wondering, uh, so how much carbohydrate should we be eating at mealtime? Uh? Okay, so if you look at um, what health promotion board actually represents, right, they actually says that one quarter of your plate uh, should be filled with uh, whole grains, uh, also whole grains carbohydrates. So one quarter of the plate is actually equivalent to like one bowl of brown rice, noodles, or pasta. Uh, also known as uh, three pieces of wholemeal bread, one and a half pieces of chapati, tose, prata, or three pieces of idli. Okay. All right, so the next thing I'm probably going through is the avoiding refined sugars. So refined sugars have minimal nutritional value. It is quickly absorbed into our bloodstream and causes our blood sugar levels to spike very quickly. And it is also very high in calories, which can cause weight gain. Okay, so weight gain can also affect our blood sugar controller. All right, so refined sugars are mainly found in your foods and beverages, such as 
your cakes, your quays, your sweets and chocolate, your ice cream, and also the sweet desserts that's found at the hawker center. All this, all right. So for beverages, there will, it will be like a three in one coffee, your fruit juice, the malted beverages like your Milo, Horlicks, and also things like your sugar, honey, and condensed milk, and the canned drinks and soft drinks uh, and also with the young, more popular with the younger populations would be the um, bubble tea uh. Okay, so these are some ways to reduce your sugar intake. So firstly, to avoid high sugar foods and drinks, to choose unsweetened or sugar-free products such as plain water, plain tea or coffee without sugar, diet soft drinks and also sugar-free sweets. Okay, so when you're ordering beverages at the Kopi Tiam or at the coffee shop, you can ask for Siu Tai or Hosong or choose the 25% of zero sugar beverages or less syrup or no syrup. Okay, so to replace your fruit juice with fresh fruit, okay, and also to prepare your own drinks and dessert without the use of sugar, or I mean, if you want a sweet taste, you can try to use artificial sweetener. All right, so the more important point is that um, there's this myth la, among a lot of people is that people always think that diluting their drinks actually reduces the sugar content. Actually, it does not. La. So for example, you add, Five, these, uh, five grams of sugar uh, into a cup of, cup of water. Uh. Five grams of sugar, it will still be five grams of sugar. Uh. No matter how much water you add, it will still be five grams of sugar. Yeah, so just take note. Uh. Okay, so this is a, a table that uh, shows you the high sugar foods and the low sugar alternative. Uh. So instead of having white sugar, brown sugar, gula malacca, rock sugar, um, you can actually choose uh, those like natural flavoring, such as cinnamon powder, pandan, and also artificial sweeteners. Uh. Okay, so instead of using condensed milk in your beverages, you can go for low-fat milk or low-fat evaporated milk. Okay, then instead of having those normal sweets and lollies, uh, going for the sugar-free ones will be better. And choose the fresh and frozen fruit instead of the canned and dried fruit. Okay. All right, so these are some of the uh, beverages. Uh. Okay, so... Um, instead of having those kopi or teh uh, with the condensed milk and sugar, go for the black coffee or, or the black tea. Uh, okay, and then instead of going for like the milk tea, go for like the oolong tea. And to go for, um, instead of having the green tea frappuccino that you can get at like Starbucks or coffee bean, uh, to go for like the normal green tea that you can brew at home. Okay, and for the soya milk, right? It's best to go for the unsweetened ones and you want to have like a cola based drinks or soft soft drinks, right? Go for the sugar-free ones. Okay, then for Milo or malted drinks, go for the cocoa beverages uh, without milk and sugar. That will be healthier. Okay, so now I'll just move on to talk to you guys about fiber. So dietary fiber is actually the indigestible portion in a plant. All right, so fiber is actually important to prevent a rapid rise in blood sugar levels. It is good for weight management and helps to lower your cholesterol levels. Okay, so help you to have regular bowel movement and prevents constipation. Okay, so some of the sources of um, whole grain products are like your brown rice, wholemeal bread, your brown rice, bihun, wholemeal, uh, whole wheat, spaghetti, chapati, uh, your oats, and also your um, wholemeal, whole wheat biscuit. Uh. Alright, so these are just some options that you can choose to have like um, brown rice instead of white rice, to have wholemeal bread instead of white bread, and to have the whole wheat biscuit instead of the plain biscuit. biscuit la. So I think for the elderly population, um, some of them are not really receptible to um, having brown rice completely. La. So what we actually recommend is that you can actually mix your brown rice and white rice. It's actually still better than taking white rice alone. La. Okay, so for one day's uh, recommended, fruits and vegetable serves is that you should have two fruits per day and um, two serves of vegetables. Uh. Two, so one serve of vegetable is like half your plate. Uh. So half your plate should be filled with vegetable. Uh. Okay, so that's one serve. So maybe one serve at lunch, one serve at dinner. Okay, so mainly today I'm mainly be talking about the two dietary recommendations of diabetes, mainly through controlling carbohydrate intake and increasing fiber intake. Okay, so just know that this is only the brief version. Uh. So actually, if we see patients in the hospital, right, it's more than this. Uh. Okay, so this is just like a 10 minutes uh, presentation. Uh. So I only can go through these two points. All right, thank you so much. Hi, thank you for our speakers for the informative sharing. 
Uh, now we move on to our Q&A session, uh, which will be answering questions from that have been submitted through the Q&A chat. If you all do have any more questions uh, afterwards, do remember to just type into the Q&A chat. We'll be answering as we go on. Lah. So I'll just direct, uh, there's this first question uh, regarding will diabetes deteriorate as we age? Will it get worse even if we follow doctor's instructions closely? I'll just direct this question to Dr. Yo. Hello, thank you for the question. I think it's a very good question that a lot of our patients ask us in our clinic. We are very religious in following the instructions given by our doctors, our dietitian and pharmacists. We take our medications regularly and we monitor our blood sugar very frequently as well. We are also careful with what we eat. We try to avoid excessive carbohydrates intake as well. But like Damien's case scenario that she shared earlier, sometimes despite our best efforts, our diabetes can progress with time and with time, our body's ability to cope and produce insulin may reduce over time. How quickly this happens uh, vary from individual to individual. Uh, but the more careful we are in being regular with our medications and our food, the longer we can preserve our pancreatic ability and our pancreas ability to produce insulin. So to answer your question directly, uh, this is very complex and complicated. But the better we take care of our health and our medications, the longer we can prevent our diabetes from deteriorating even as we age. But it's still important to see the doctor regularly to see whether what we are doing is keeping our health and diabetes in check. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yu. I'll move on to the second question. I'll direct this to Sister Lincia. Uh, should we buy our injection needles in bulk or only buy when we finish each batch? Uh, thank you so much for your questions. This will depend on the frequency of the injections. If we are inject once per day because all the syringe in box and the needles in box is come in 100. So if you only inject once per day, you can just buy one box sufficient. However, if you have received an insulin injection three to four times per day, then you might want to buy a few box that come in box because sometimes can have promotion rate, then can save some money. But bear in mind that always check the expired date on the box because sometimes the promotion can be going to nearby expired. So better to check the box of the expired date. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Liancia. I'll move on to the next question. If we're on medications, can we still eat as per normal? Uh, this question, I'll direct it to Jiami. So thank you for the question. Um, I think this is a question that a lot of patients generally ask, whether if we eat medications, uh, do we still have to control our diet? La? So of course, the medications do help to bring down the blood sugar. But ultimately, it's a balance of what we take in and how much the medications can bring down the blood sugar. Therefore, if you're talking about uh, leading, eating normally like a healthy diet, yes, that's possible. However, as Brian has addressed, uh, we need to have a healthy diet. So we do need to make some, slight mo some modifications to our diet by avoiding things that are very high in uh, refined sugars, increasing our fiber intake and other measures as well. Uh, it's a multi-pronged approach uh, and medications is just one of them. So uh, while the medications do bring down our blood sugars, we need to still eat healthy and exercise well to keep our pancreatic function uh, well as far as possible and maintain good diabetes control. Okay, thank you, Jiami. I'll move on to the next question, which I'll direct to Brian. Is there a limit to the amount of artificial sweetener that we can consume since it's not sugar? And will it cause any health concern since they are chemicals okay so this is a very good question i get this question like um quite a lot for my patients so basically right um with artificial sweetener they are generally safe uh, for use in um not really there's not really a, a limit that we should actually uh, um, try to avoid or limit ourselves but the other thing to take note with um, artificial sweetener is that um, because they are not actually digested right by the body so what actually happens is that if you take too much artificial sweetener it can cause you to have a lot of gas and for some people also is that um, they can they can do have like diarrhea lah, if you take so much. But I do have like other concerns from my 
like um, other patients is that um, they do say that uh, I've read like, online that um, artificial sweeteners do cause cancer, this kind of things. So I just want to address the fact that it actually does not. Uh, so actually those studies that um, shows that artificial sweeteners cause cancer are actually done in um, animal studies. Uh, so animal studies are actually not, um, cannot actually um, compare it to humans. And sometimes the dose that they actually feed these animals with artificial sweeteners are actually very, very high dose that we cannot really take it um, through it through like normal ingestion uh, so it's actually um quite safe uh, so just to uh, address this concern yeah okay thank you brian uh, i'll address the next question to dr yo can i recover from gestational diabetes is there a higher risk of getting it if my relatives have it before okay um i think this is also a very common question that we get from the clinic uh can we recover from gestational diabetes? As the name suggests, the diabetes is usually during gestation, so during pregnancy itself. We expect it to go away after delivery, and usually once two months after delivery, we should schedule or repeat oral glucose tolerance tests with our gynecologist or any GP or poly clinic. It should resolve and the oral glucose tolerance test should go back to normal. If it does not go back to normal after delivery, uh, we will be concerned about whether gestational diabetes has become what we call type 2 diabetes because we are no longer pregnant. Our pregnancy placental hormones are already gone. But despite the removal of that stress to the body, the body is still unable to cope with, it, with its usual sugar load or glucose load. In that case, we will be concerned about us having developed type 2 diabetes and needing medications even when we are not pregnant. So definitely, uh, that will be a cause of concern. And gestational diabetes, even if it has gone away after the pregnancy, is also a long-term irreversible risk factor for us developing type 2 diabetes later in life. So gestational diabetes could have occurred when we are in our 20s, when our 30s, when we are pregnant. It can go away for one year, five years, and even 10 years after delivery. But our lifetime risk of getting type 2 diabetes is still higher than a lady who did not have gestational diabetes. It's still important to go for regular health screening and about annual oral glucose tolerance test or regular health screening to check for type 2 diabetes later in life. Um, and is there a higher risk of getting gestational diabetes is if our relatives have had it? The answer is yes, just like if we are overweight uh, or if we have a family history, someone in the family has got type 2 diabetes, our risk of getting gestational diabetes when we are pregnant is also higher. Uh, regardless of our risk, I think there is universal screening. That means every pregnant lady is recommended to go for oral glucose tolerance test between 24 to 28 weeks of our pregnancy by our gynecologist. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Yeo. I have another question. Uh, what is the likelihood of getting stroke due to diabetes? Uh, okay, I think I'll take this question too. Uh, we must understand that stroke is not a straightforward medical problem. It's often due to multiple risk factors, including diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and uh, family history, for example, if stroke disease runs in the family. Definitely, uh, diabetes is an important risk factor, but it's difficult for us to say the exact risk and percentage because it depends on if we have any other risk factors that are named. Regardless, uh, if we have diabetes and if we control our diabetes properly, definitely the risk of having stroke is lower than someone who has diabetes and does not control diabetes properly. Other important things to check would be things that I mentioned earlier. High blood pressure, high cholesterol and smoking are important risk factors as well. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yeo. Uh, next question, I'll direct it to Brian. Do drinks like Coke Zero actually contain less sugar or do they just use other sweeteners that may be just as unhealthy and are they really healthier? 
Okay, yeah, so I do get this uh, question quite a lot as well from my patients. Okay, so basically, right, Coke Zero is like, um, it actually doesn't have any sugar. La. It only has artificial sweetener. So the other thing is that um, then you, we, if you ask like, okay, then can I just like uh, spam Coke Zero, drink Coke Zero as much as possible? The answer is actually no. La. So what happens is that um, if you take a lot of Coke Zero, right, Coke Zero actually has something called phosphoric acid as well. So it will corrode your teeth. La. So it will, check, will it actually affect your dental health. Okay, so your teeth may actually become more porous and can actually become more loose. La. So definitely, um, I would say it will still be better than taking the regular Coke because it doesn't affect your blood sugar level and it doesn't um, contribute to weight gain. But um, do, do so in uh, moderation. Uh, don't do it until like uh, your teeth are corroded and yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. I have another question for Brian. Uh, which fruits should diabetics avoid? Okay, so um, actually, right, with fruits, right, um, actually, don't necessarily need to avoid anything. You just need to eat it in moderation. Uh. So, for example, um, if you're eating, like, durian, right, you don't just, I mean, durian actually still can eat, but you, you take only, like, maybe two seeds at one go. You don't take, like, um, so I, I know, like, right, when people take durian, right, they don't just take two seeds. Uh. They take, like, more than two seeds. So, that's, that's when it actually affects their blood sugar control. Okay, the other thing is that, um, for fruit, right, to take note of is um, something like uh, banana. So banana, right, it comes in varying sizes, different sizes. La. So like what I mentioned earlier just now, controlling the portion of the food that you take. La. So for example, if you buy the Philippine banana, the Del Monte banana, it's usually very long, very big, very thick. La. So for example, if you're to eat that kind of banana, right, definitely your um, blood sugar levels right, will definitely um, shoot up more because it has more carbohydrates in it compared to like a small banana. So our recommendations for diabetic patients is that um, if you want to take banana, right, just go for like the small ones, la, like the medium size small ones. Don't go for like the very long ones because that one will definitely affect your blood sugar control. So it's mainly more on portion size. La, la, okay, so just go for like the small ones. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll move on to the next question. Does metformin cause weight loss? I'll direct this question to Jiamin. Hi, thanks for the question. So um it really so metformin, right? Actually it's what we call weight neutral, weight neutral, or it causes some slight weight loss. So it, it depends on person to person. Uh, sometimes it doesn't affect the patient's weight, or sometimes it might cause a slight weight loss of a couple of kilos, which may be beneficial for some people who are overweight, which increases the risk of diabetes and other cardiac issues as well. However, it should not cause very huge uh, weight loss like tens of kg. So if um, there is very significant weight loss and it's troubling you, do let your doctor, your physician know as well. Okay. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, next question. If I have pre-diabetes, what must I do? Uh, I don't want to take any medications. So this question, maybe I'll direct to Dr. Yu. Um, we know that pre-diabetes is actually a prelude to diabetes, um, especially type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's a very huge spectrum of disease because our body will try as much as possible to cope uh, before pre-diabetes becomes diabetes, which is why in our war on diabetes, there's a lot of emphasis on pre-diabetes management and pre-diabetes recognition. And many of us do not like to take medications where possible. But I would say that please discuss this with your doctor. Some of us with many um, other risk factors, for example, pre-existing uh, pre heart conditions, stroke conditions, or those of us who are overweight or obese may benefit from medications earlier rather than later. Uh, like what Jamin discussed in her slides, we can use simple oral medications instead of having to proceed directly on the insulin injections when we are later diagnosed with diabetes. Regardless, there are many things we can do, uh, be it whether we are pre-diabetic or when we have diabetes, in terms of changing our lifestyle, uh, introducing uh, some exercises, as well as adjusting the type of food that we eat, like what Brian mentioned earlier, to try to control our blood sugar levels. Uh, like what Sister Joyce, taught us about earlier about insulin injection 
There's also another part, important part about blood sugar management, which will help tell us what we eat and what it makes of our blood sugar to help decide our food portions and food type to keep our blood sugar within healthy limits. So I'd say, uh, do discuss this with your doctor because we would like to individualize and personalize your treatment for you to what you need best. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yu. Uh, I have a question for Brian. It's actually from the chat. Uh, does diabetic patients have to watch their magnesium and fiber intake if they have renal problems too? Okay, so um, with regards to um, watching your potassium intake, right? So basically, I cannot just um, say it out like that because we need to check. First of all, we need to check your um, your blood results. So if your if your renal problem actually uh, causes uh, your potassium levels to be high, right? Then definitely you will need to be will need to be restricted, lah. So, but uh, not necessarily all patients with uh, renal problems, right? Needs to um, restrict their potassium. Uh, it's only if the potassium is high. All right. So with regards to fiber intake um, for diabetic patients is that um, it would be good uh, to have a bit more um, veg fruit, uh, vegetables, fruits and vegetables, I mean, in the diet. Uh, uh, mainly like um, because um, one thing is that what, what I mentioned earlier, um, fiber actually helps to um, keep us full and it also helps to, um, and therefore it can help with, uh, help to, with weight control. And the other thing is that um, fiber also helps to uh, um, slow down the, the digestion of foods. Uh. So it actually causes the blood sugar to be released actually slower into the bloodstream. So as a result of that, it actually can actually um, improve your blood sugar control. Yeah. So yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, so looking through, if there's no further questions, then we've come to the end of our Q&A session. So I'll hand it over. Okay, thank you uh, to our panelists for answering all our questions. Um, so if, if that is all, we have reached the end of today's Zoom webinar session. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, could we just uh, invite everyone to just stay on for a short while as we have some announcements. So uh, for our first announcement, we'll be holding our next talk uh, on 24th September, uh, which is this Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, it is titled Acupressure for Relieving Common Aches and Pain. You may email us at cha at ttsh.com.sg for more details. Uh, for our second announcement, uh, uh, TTSH will be holding our annual Singapore Patient Conference on the 29th and 30th of October. There will be two plenaries on the 29th. Uh, first plenary is titled Health Education, the Key to a Transformed Community. And the second plenary is titled Building Mental Resilience, a Supportive Community and the Road Ahead. Uh, on 30th of October, which is our dedicated Singapore Patient Action Awards Day, uh, we'll be screening sharings by our invisible heroes in health and social care on their contributions in enhancing the healing journey of patients. Uh, with that, would you, everyone, please kindly fill in the feedback form via the QR code shown on the screen. If not, you may uh, type in the link on the screen, which is www.bit.ly slash childhealthtalk. And after you are done with the feedback form, you may leave the webinar. Thank you so much for today.